Hello, my name is Paul Marchbanks, and this is Digging in the Dirt, with a few observations about a great action-adventure film that virtually no one born in the 21st century has ever heard of, Mimi Letters' The Peacemaker. In 1997, four years before 9-11 dramatically shifted global politics, Mimi Letter directed a film about a terrorist attack which targets New York City. Having cut her teeth in the television industry for 10 years, she won the honor of directing her very first feature film for DreamWorks Pictures, a brand new company which trusted her to launch their brand with a compelling action film. Letter succeeded, and even though the storyline of The Peacemaker includes plenty of cliches, she transforms the genre in a manner that stands out clearly when set alongside other contemporary action films. George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, friends in film school, reinvented action-adventure in the 1970s and 80s, injecting such popcorn fare with rapid pacing, frenetic action, and just the right smattering of comedy. Those seeking edgier thrills and more visceral violence could find it in a never-ending stream of movies starring Sylvester Stallone or Arnold Schwarzenegger, with body counts as large as their star's muscles. In the 90s, convincing CGI altered the cinematic landscape further. To hold our attention, heroes now needed to either escape unscathed from unexpected threats like rampaging dinosaurs and hostile extraterrestrials, or perform seemingly impossible stunts. In the summer before The Peacemaker's October release, Actor Nicolas Cage took theaters by storm with two action movies which epitomized how ludicrous the genre had become. Con Air, released on June the 2nd of 1997, is about an unjustly convicted army ranger who ends up on a transport plane filled with, as the title suggests, the country's most dangerously deranged criminals. Gloriously delirious mayhem ensues. And then there's Face Off, released only two weeks later, which broke audiences' minds with an identity-swapping face transplantation, a caricature of a human being as addicted to violence as he is to drugs, and absurd testosterone-laden action scenes with airborne speedboats, bodies and bullet casings falling in equal measure to the floor, and a flurry of doves who somehow fly unharmed, in slow motion of course, to the middle of a bloody firefight. Equally unrealistic is the configuration of female heroes in such films, representations that tend to skew towards one extreme or another. Either they're a damsel in need of rescuing, or they're a hard-as-nails combatant who brushes off scrapes and bruises as a matter of course. In Con Air, Cameron Poe gets himself in trouble because he's defending his vulnerable wife from some drunken bar hoppers, playing out a familiar scenario at least as old as Victorian novels like Charles Dickens' Barnaby Rudge and George Eliot's Felix Holt. In Face Off, an undercover Sean Archer briefly aligns himself with a bombshell who knows her way around an MP5A3 submachine gun, a female archetype that has plenty of ancestors and even more descendants. The 18th entry in the Bond franchise, which also came out in 1997, contributed yet another heroine of this sort, a young Michelle Yeoh who needed neither guns nor knives to wipe the floor with her adversaries. What each of these action films lacks is a protagonist of either sex who responds in a practical, sensible way to nearly being killed and watching others die. Someone whose emotional reaction to bloodshed feels relatable. Such a hero would not run screaming for the hills, but they wouldn't move fluidly from danger to danger without pausing to catch their breath, either. Their courage, in the midst of a crisis, would be the more admirable because the stress of their situation actually registered on their faces and had a measurable effect on their bodies. It's almost as though the existence of war films inspired by actual conflicts, movies which have traditionally done a much better job representing the trauma associated with violence, has long freed audiences to expect the absurd when the chaos unfolding on screen can be written off as fiction. 
Somewhere around the turn of the century, the genre began to change. The 2000 aughts contained their share of preposterous action movies, but they also spawned entries which elicited more gasps than laughs, drawing the action into an emotional roller coaster containing as many stomach emptying drops as exhilarating thrills. The Born Supremacy, Mission Impossible 3, and Casino Royale landed like punches to the gut, knocking the air out of both their male lead and audience by forcing us to identify with the terror of imminent loss, a feat these films achieved without either sexually objectifying or infantilizing the women under threat. The attacks in New York and Washington on September 11th, 2001 were definitely a factor in this shift towards more meaningful, heartfelt action films. But I'd like to suggest that Letters Film is another likely factor in this shift. She paves the way for her successors by offering us a female lead whose abilities effectively complement those of her male counterpart, a strong woman whose compassion makes her a better leader and a more discerning operative. Halfway through Letters Film, our heroes end up in a hotel room after surviving a near-death experience. If this were a 90s Bond film, they'd fall into each other's arms five seconds after walking through the door, and would work out the stress of recent events with some vigorous lovemaking. Letter knows this plot point well and nods to it with the art she selects as wall dressing. <laughs> Prints of Gustav Klimt's paintings The Woman in Gold and The Kiss frame the scene, the first capturing the potential eroticism of the appreciative heterosexual male gaze in the presence of a beautiful woman, and the second telegraphing the physical intimacy that would likely follow if this film were directed by anyone else. Instead, the two co-workers decompress in a shockingly realistic way. His head in his hands, Colonel Thomas DeVoe grieves the death of a friend and anticipates the trauma that will descend on his surviving family members. Dr. Julia Kelly sits immobilized in a chair, working through the shock of watching people get killed for the first time. Letter slows the film down long enough to allow the consequences of violence to settle on her characters instead of immediately glossing over their distress with sex or another action scene. Dr. Kelly is attractive, yes, but this seems irrelevant to her character, a feature far less important than her intelligence and resilience. Letter skillfully unpacks decades of cinematic baggage in the first five minutes that Nicole Kidman's character appears on screen. Her introduction in a swimming pool could easily have been packed with slow shots moving over Kidman's curves, capped with our hero getting out of the pool in a way that shows ample cleavage. Instead, Letter's crew puts Kidman in a no-nonsense swimsuit used for exercise, not titillation, cuts quickly among underwater shots that show off her athleticism and strength, and then grants her the opportunity to ignore a male underling who comments on her wet hair when she's called to action without having time to dry it. In her second scene, Dr. Kelly holds the rapt attention of a room filled with military personnel, coolly navigates the flak thrown up by an officer who openly disagrees with her assumptions, and returns to her office to find a bouquet of roses from a former suitor, flowers she promptly tosses in the trash. In a 1940s rom-com, or more recent Hallmark holiday special, such rejection of romance would eventually be countered by the suave overtures of her male companion, the very one who happened to refute her ideas in public moments earlier. Tension would soon dissolve into affection. George Clooney has played many such characters before, and we might expect him to do so again. Not in Letters film. Two decades before sexual assault cases against Harvey Weinstein combined with the Me Too movement to transform the film industry, Letter anticipated our need for movies that place powerful women center stage without yielding to the public's desire for casual sex, unnecessary nudity, and equally gratuitous violence. 
The ultimate action film, it is not, particularly in light of what the Mission Impossible movies have since become and all that Marvel superhero movies have accomplished. I highly recommend Black Panther and Captain America Winter Soldier. Letters film does not provide car chases as cool as those in The Transporter and Baby Driver, fight scenes as skillfully choreographed as those in The Raid 2 or The Woman King, and most definitely lacks the witty repartee of Tom Holland's turn as Spider-Man. What Letter does successfully do is provide an effective template for the more sophisticated kinds of actioner that will follow it a film containing a surprisingly even-handed portrayal of those violent malcontents it is far too easy to dismiss as terrorists, a balance facilitated in large part by its strong, courageous, and very perceptive female protagonist.